Hey everyone, today we are joined by a star of the National Wrestling Alliance. He's been seen in Championship Wrestling, Pro Wrestling Gorilla, TNA Wrestling, and various other promotions. Some know him as Johnny, while others call him Captain. Ema, sir, thank you so much for joining us for a third time. That's right. I'm just so I'm just so enjoyable to listen to. People just love it. I love it. I love talking to you. I love your insight. You know, you're officially going to become the uh, second most. Uh, I don't even know how to phrase that. You've been on the show the second most times. That's the best way I can phrase it. I'm gonna I'm gonna top it. I'm gonna be like uh the that club on SNL of people who've hosted it seven times, they get a jacket. Yeah, it does. You know, you were so close to tying Sal, but then we had a schedule mishap and we had to reschedule. So Sal was able to skip ahead yesterday to number four. Oh, he swooped. <laughs> and then Tim Storm, he's coming for you too, though, because we have a third one at some point coming up. So a lot of the NWA uh, well, guys, I'm lucky. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's great. I'm glad. I'm glad. You know, we and those are, you know, obviously people I work closely with and and work and have always worked well with. So I like hearing that, you know, that you've been having a good time learning from them too. Oh, uh, it's been a delight. Now, we have a lot of questions to get to, and like the genius I am, you know, everyone knows how these shows go. Uh, we go off on a thousand tangents. We have notes, and we'll get to like five questions because we'll go to a thousand <laughs> other questions. But I did get some viewer questions I'd like to add in. But before we do all that. Let's hit the plugs first, knock them out of the way. Where can people check you out? What should people do? Where can you get t-shirts? Um, you can always go to uh, – so the main places to follow me where I'm most active are Instagram and Twitter. Same username, at Yuma Boma, Y-U-M-A-B-O-O-M-A. Uh, that's pretty much my username everywhere if you have social media. And then uh, I have a YouTube channel with old matches and fun toy opening videos with my son. It's uh, Johnny Yuma Rocks on YouTube. And then, um, you know, obviously you can check out the NWA on YouTube. I work behind the scenes on this brand new season of Power that looks fantastic. So please go check it out on NWA's official YouTube channel. And then if you want to buy shirts, we've got classic shirts that go back as far as 2010. Um, ProWrestlingTees.com slash Rockness, R-O-C-K-N-E-S. And we will definitely dive into the new era of the NWA. But guys, we'll have links to all of that stuff in the description Show some support, follow them on all the different platforms, and please buy a t-shirt. These guys are offering their time to give insight, entertaining stories, so show some support back because that's how wrestling works. we got to show love to the wrestlers, and the wrestlers show love to the fans. Thank you. I appreciate that. No problem. So I just want to get get right to it because I'm so curious about the new era of the NWA. And for those of you who don't know, could you refresh what your current role is in the NWA and then talk about the new era? The I won't call it a relaunch necessarily, but it's almost like a rebranding of the Lightning One era. Honestly, so yeah. So, I mean, at the NWA, I'm one of the, uh, you know, I work backstage behind the scenes as a producer working, you know, from anywhere from uh, match agents, uh, agenting uh, matches, especially I work with a lot of the newcomers. Uh, and then um, I also work on a lot of the other stuff like entrances, pre-tape promos, things like that. Uh, so I kind of have my finger in a lot of different pies at the NWA uh, with power. Uh, haven't wrestled there in a while, which is OK with me and my tired old body, although I am ready to go at any time. Um, and then, uh, you know, basically, you know, 75th anniversary hit and a, a lot of stories wrapped up and new ones began. And, you know, to hit such a milestone like 75 years of anything is crazy and then to deliver the way everyone did in terms of matches like i mean those matches were insane you got to go back and watch colby carino's match you got to go watch homicides match you have to watch camille uh defend the title you know you got to watch maxi and paler win the tv title like there's just so much that happened that shows what a good foot forward the company's taking with young talent and diverse talent um, and I think that's important in so many ways. And also, so it's just good. These people are good at wrestling and they're fun to watch. And, you know, you might not be able to say that about every era of any program. Um, but now, you know, it's 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 moving forward. And wait till you see, like, the production changes on power. They're already really cool. Got a whole new vibe to the entrances and, and like, just everything. It's just it's just great big leap forward in my opinion you know we hit a mountaintop at 75 and and it's just like you know it's just we jumped even higher and so i think people are going to really enjoy what's coming i did I, th 
I the set the looks great. Tape. <laughs> you know, yeah, no, it's set. awesome. It's it's still the old school, but with a mix of like a video game vibe almost, which is you know something I think most wrestling fans enjoy, especially wrestling video games. So to give it that kind of like almost like No Mercy entrance style vibe, I think it's really cool. It's unique, and it's also not what you would expect from a company like nwa you know we still got the flags hanging we still got that classic studio look just with a nice new modern twist on it that's not even it's not even anything crazy or drastic but it's real nice the end product is really cool uh, it it looks so professional which i think is such a huge thing you know? but then again the nwa has for you know ever since they came back in the lightning one era you know it, it's crisp it's been looking great, and this is like you said, it's just the next upgrade, and it's great to see. And the one thing I do want to touch on specifically that you mentioned is the young talent, and I credit a lot of this to Dr. Tom Pritchard because a lot of them are, you know, his trainees. And uh, you know, first one who comes to mind, and if you want to talk about them individually, just collectively, it's fine. Kenzie Page, she's awesome. She's someone I hope to have on the channel in the future. She's so young in her career, but the way she's evolved from when she was first on NWA to now is insane, dude. I could say a million positive things about Kenzie Page. She and I actually started the exact same weekend in Atlanta. And both of us were really there, you know, fish out of water. Like she was from Dr. Tom's school, but Dr. Tom wasn't coming around yet. But he was still someone everyone obviously trusted to send new and young talent that he had helped, you know, coach. So Kenzie was there, you know, on, you know, obviously great recommendations, super young you know, super nervous to be kind of, you know, on TV and being guided by people like Jazz and Medusa. So, you know, kind of a lot at once for a really, really young talent. And then she got hurt like right away bad in her first match. I can't remember what the match was, but she had dislocated her shoulder. Oh, wow. and I've had that happen to both. I've had it twice on my right, once on my left. It is fucking terrible. Pardon my language. It's fine. It is awful, awful pain. And she toughed it out and very, very creatively worked around the injury in a second round match because that was the way the tournament had laid out. It really relied on this one match with, with you know, a, a newcomer in it to help the tournament go the way it needed to go for the sake of all the stories that were coming out of it. And so, you know, of course, they were like, hey, take a break. And then she said, no, I can get through it. And so she came, they had come up together with a safe way to get through it. She toughed it out, that story, everything else got to continue on because she was creative enough to figure out how to work around an injury. And it was her idea. Obviously, everyone was like, no, you need to go. And she figured out a way. And like, you know, at the end of the day, should we risk further injury? That can go both ways. That's a, you know, that's a very tight rope to walk. But it was her idea to do it and tough it out and save the day for the show, basically. And imagine doing that on your first day in a company. Yeah. You know, what an impression to make. To, you know, grit your teeth, tough it out, which is all the NWA is always about is about toughness. They always talk about that. Tough, tough, tough. Kenzie Page is tough. She proved it her very first day in the company, her very first loop with them. And I watched it happen and I've helped her and watched her the whole way because she's someone that will ask anybody for help. She's not afraid to ask someone with a very different style. She'll go to someone like Dr. Tom and be guided by him all the way, but still not afraid to come to someone who had done more modern PWG style, whatever you want to call it, uh, wrestling and give my input when she wants to kick up the pace a little bit. So, you know, it should just ask so many questions. She's got a lot of great help from friends like Colby Carino. I've seen him really help her and, and she's just got it. I don't know how to explain it. She's just got it. She's tough as nails. Survived Max, Maxi Impaler. Yeah. And then to go on and survive a battle royal and then to go on and defeat Camille, it was insane. Like, what an insane weekend for her and her future is, you know, as bright as it can be. Yeah, the sky's the limit. And you brought up something pretty interesting there. And again, just right from the beginning, we're already going off on tangents. <laughs> uh, you mentioned, the, you know, the fact that you had the PWG influence and the indie style. And another guy who, again, we just talked to him last night, Sal Renaro, he had the ring of honor style and now he's doing producing backstage as well. So do you see that as kind of like, you know, you two kind of blend the new era with the old era? Cause this is specifically what Sal brought up. He brought up how Dr. Tom has probably never been in a triple threat match in his entire career because it wasn't a thing then. And while mm -hmm. you guys came up where, you know, three ways, four ways, five ways, they're a common thing now. You know what I mean? So you guys are kind of blend, meshing the two different eras of the veterans who bring wealth and decades of experience. And then you guys who have 
a lot of experience yourself, but with a different era and a different style. And, and you know what, Sal and I, in so many ways, do bring that to the back. And like he brings all that experience with ROH, but also ROH on TV. Yeah. And he worked he worked at TNA forever as well, so he knows the TV side too whereas i was in pwg but also always on championship wrestling from hollywood and then behind the scenes so you know we were both kind of in that weird uh like spot where the stuff that's being taped in tv style tv formats with that kind of production and understanding but with the in-ring style of roh and pwg like that's what especially my era of hollywood that's what i was trying to push higher paced things like that you know not every match but and so, yeah, like, I mean, you've got Dr. Tom and you've got Jazz and you've got Pat Kenny. And then we've had, you know, a bunch of, you know, different agents come through and really help like Raven. So many different perspectives. And then now for them to listen to voices like mine and like Sal's that come from an era that is almost the antithesis of the NWA and its roots, especially, you know, it's really cool. And that shows you the progress they're trying to make and they want to make in giving a product that appeals to more than just somebody in their seventies or sixties or whatever, you know, I'm not trying to date people, but <laughs> you know, people who grew up on the NWA, they might not like the mile a minute car crash style of a TNA X division, but guess what? There's a whole layer of audience that does. And that's where you get awesome matches like Jack cartwheel and Colby Carino. And then, you know, the scrambles we've been having lately, you know, and a lot of those matches are guided by homicide who absolutely has yeah. that every different level of intensity. His favorite wrestler on the planet is Terry Funk, mm -hmm. but he can also wrestle, and he did wrestle like the greatest kinds of ROH wrestlers. He is one of them. Yeah. And it's just crazy, you know, that, that just shows you that broad spectrum of minds backstage, you know, from jazz guiding the women to homicide guiding, you know, a lot of the younger guys. And then now me and Sal getting to dip our toe and guiding, especially the younger talent, for sure. That's definitely who we work with more. Um, but yeah, you know, it's it's very cool to see that they're open to different styles and different minds guiding each match so that they stand out in their own way. I have a theory, and uh, I brought it up to Sal, and he, he seemed to agree, and I'm curious what you think, because it, for me, you know, we've talked before, and you've said, even though you've done a lot of the indie style, you're actually a bigger fan of, you know, the older style, you know, especially like 90s WWF and, you know, that mm -hmm. period... So I'm curious where you fall on this. A lot of veterans, you know, especially in the, you know, not to date them, but the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, you know, you, the Jim Cornettes, the Bruce Pitchers, the Eric Bischoffs, they don't particularly like three ways, four ways, five ways. But I have a theory that that's almost 99% in age in a generation gap because as a fan and as people who have, you know, it's been around for what, 20 years now, 25 years now, they've been a very common thing. People grow up and now fans love it, you know, and I think it's less to do that. It doesn't have a story, but it's a different kind of story and you have to work around it differently. I, I think I think that as someone that does love, like, you know, actually a lot more old school, simple TV style wrestling, I, I just think there's absolutely a place for that other kind. Personally, as a wrestler, I hate being in a three-way. And I bet if, you, if, if, if it Sal brought it up, I bet he would tell you the same thing. Being in a triple threat or three-way dance, or Harder. it's just, it's the worst. It sucks. But it does automatically create a new story. That's why I love tag team wrestling, because there is built-in tension. If you do it right, there is a built-in tension of cutting the ring off in half and then someone being in peril, needing rescue from their partner, working together to survive that's built into the rules of that match and then because of the way a three-way dance or whatever may work there's new built-in ways to tell a story and that's why i just think you know it's stupid to not have a little i mean who who doesn't like a buffet mm -hmm. i don't want steak for all six matches you know i want i might want to start with mozzarella sticks six of them in a <laughs> scramble you know what i mean absolutely like, like, it's just, I just don't, I will never understand not wanting variety in a wrestling show. Even if it's so you can go take a piss. Mm -hmm. I don't care. I don't care because, you know, really, you know, loud and vocal people and fans, you know, in a lot of ways, they do guide away uh, the way a show goes. And so 
you know, hey, I would rather you go take a piss and go sit out there and boo or shit on a match just because it's not the kind of style you like. Go ahead, go go get some popcorn, go get some snacks. It does that's that's better, you know. Go take a breather, so maybe you're a little more refreshed and jazzed about the next match that might be more your cup of tea. Maybe it's a nice one on one between two heavyweights, whatever. You know, it's just there is room for everything on every card. If you've got more than one match on a show, guess what? There's room for more than one style. Uh, that's a great way of putting it. And I think another point that Sal brought up, which I hadn't really considered, but, you know, we do live in the social media and TikTok generation where, you know, attention spans aren't quite what they used to be, right? So the benefit of a triple threat match, a four-way, a five-way, a six-way, you know, for most of it, if not all of it, there's action. Boom, boom, boom. And again, that has this pluses and drawbacks, especially for the talent involved. But, you know, if you have it on the card, you're likely to keep people's attention with it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's so easy to look at your phone, even in the middle of a movie that you chose to put on. You could go to work for eight hours and be like, when I get home, I want to watch this. I've been dying to watch this movie. And every so often, you, you might still glance at your phone. That is just the way we are wired now, unfortunately. And so a longer match that may not have as much eye-catching stuff, you might end up looking at your phone or looking at the program. And there's nothing wrong with that. But, uh, you know, the shorter attention spans get, the more matches and shows need to adapt to that. And, you know, I think you can adapt to an extent and then still guide them the way you want. You're still in control of, of your audience if you're, you're doing things right and appealing to them on, not you know, 90% of the levels. You can still guide them where you want to go. Meet them halfway and then try to guide them the rest. So, yeah, I think quick, you know, hype, you know, explosive matches, those are important nowadays, especially nowadays when people's brain works in highlight reels because of the way TikTok and Vine and everything's been over the past 10 years. You know, it just what you said, it just clicked. Uh, you know how sometimes an old memory can be unlocked in your head randomly just out of nowhere? I was just yeah. thinking of like from the good old days of YouTube when it would be like the top 25 moves of Super Dragon. And oh, like there would always be those random. It's like those aren't even made anymore, I don't think. And I would love to see that make a return somehow. You know what I mean? And you know what's funny too is like those videos ended up sometimes pretty long mm. because they wouldn't just show like, you know, the two second move itself they show the whole up and over duck one hit the rope set up and so those videos often ended up pretty damn long over over time especially when they got in the top top hundred moves yeah. of uh of you know i don't know Heaven it was always like top, and... top 100 moves of ruckus in czw and you're yeah. like all right i guess i'm gonna watch this for 30 minutes i'm guessing a lot of it just comes down to like copyright issues and that's why it doesn't happen as much but you know even like promotions like i feel like if you know, WWE did, like, the top 10 moves of Ricochet. Just that alone, like, I feel like that would get a ton of views. And you know what? They did do stuff like that for quite a while on social media. They had really nice little short videos. Same with their YouTube channel. I think it was kind of like pre-network. I felt like there would be a lot of, like, I just remember they started with, like, ding, 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 like a bell, like, sound, and then top 10. Like, no voiceover or anything, just a commentary when it would show the clip. And like it'd be brief and it would show like top 10 shooting stars or top 10, you know, choke slams. And, mm -hmm. and it was cool. And that stuff, I mean, who doesn't love a countdown? I do. <laughs> yeah. So uh, various wrestling promotions out there. Somehow you come across this. Start putting out those videos. We want to see it. <laughs> for real. Like, you know how easy it would be <laughs> for top 10 moves of Colby Carino? <laughs> oh, the yeah. Guy's got, the guy's got an arsenal. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, Kyle, uh, Joe, whoever else needs to hear it. We're letting you know <laughs> we want to see these uploaded. I'll text them. Okay, so, you know, since you brought up the six ways, or actually I think I brought it up, but either way, it became a subject that does bring us to a viewer question asked from a little while ago. John Ceramic on YouTube asked, uh, I'd be interested in his thoughts on how to give new wrestlers time with audiences that lets them grow without boring the audience. I loved how he touched on that by bringing them in with six ways. Basically, last time when we spoke, we talked about how you know, sometimes, you know, throwing new guys in the opening match isn't always fair because, you know, the crowd's always hot for them. And, you know, that it's not really them working for it and trying to figure things out. So how do you personally, like, like if you're running an indie show and you have, let's just say, three new guys, how would you ideally throw them in the card? Where would they fit? And what do you think would be best for them, for the show and everything else? So if I had three new guys, I think what I would try to do is if I had like a six match card, I would put 
two of them in the same match in a tag team match. And they would each have someone very, very experienced on their side. You know, I'm not sure if it would need to be built with story. It can just be, you know, say a match for the sake of a match on a card to introduce guys or get them reestablished. Because what you can do is you can have one new guy, you know, take take the heat and learn that portion. And then you can have the other guy learn to take the comeback from the more experienced guy who didn't take the heat. And that's some deep cut, you know, inside baseball terms or whatever. But, you know, that's just really good opportunities because getting beat up and how you react to it and how the crowd reacts to you getting beat up is, you know, the most important part of wrestling, the selling. So a good, you know, isolated chunk of time where the audience is watching you get beat up because you're isolated by the tag team. You know, that's a really good way to learn. And then the other young guy on, say, the heel side, he can be in there in the ring and learn how to be snappy and quick to make that hot baby face look like a million bucks because that is just as important. There's nothing that breaks my heart more than a dead hot tag because the heel isn't there for the baby face. You can go back and watch uh, a lot of the Rhodes versus Shield stuff. There'd be times where Goldust would be moving a thousand miles per hour in a good controlled way, like a like just absolute pro, like just on his game. He looked literally on fire. And sometimes at the time, Roman Reigns, I remember just specifically because I could hear him yell at him, get up, like get up, you know, and like it, 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 it hurts that moment. So that's something that's really important to learn. You need to learn how to just be there to get up, get down, get up, get down, get up, get down, you know, a mile a minute. So that baby face, you know, looks looks great and looks like they're on fire. I mean, so that's two birds with one stone right there. You got them each in a different spot in a tag match where they're learning two very different things. And then the other guy I would try to throw in some kind of, um, you know, more exciting match or because I think they do work, especially if you got a guy who's willing to maybe work twice a squash match. Yes, please. You know, you know, maybe on the second match of the card, you know, you know, Mr. Big Shit comes out, runs his mouth, you know, it's. Some, you know, new guy comes out, does his best, gets a little flurry in with something that looks A plus, you know, something they hit 100 percent of the time at practice. Let them get that in, shut them down. They take a big move. They sell big. That's that's important lessons right there. You know, trying to garner a reaction out of nowhere. You're going to have to do that so many times in your career, as well as, you know, when it's your chance to shine and making the most of it. If it's a big drop kick, whatever it may be. I always tell people that when it is your turn, you better take it. You better take you better take your turn and make the most of it because the other guy is giving it to you literally because it's not a real fight. They're giving you that opportunity and their body to look awesome. So you better take it. So in that moment, whatever, you know, maybe have them try to get a little in on that guy. They shut him down. They get beat. Boom. They're done. And then have that guy wrestle again later. So you didn't waste him on the card. Uh, so, I mean, that's probably what I would do because I like sometimes when a match early on affects a match later, even on an indie show. You know, there's nothing wrong with telling a story throughout the evening. I think it's important. So, yeah, that's probably how I would do, you know, three newer guys on a show that I put together. Um, you know, and if not that, depending on how they all work, you know, maybe one of them would be better off in like a hot six man because maybe they're good at, you know, some of that stuff, but not the rest. And then that's why on the next show you'd be like, OK, you you did your stuff you're good at. You know, you got an opportunity to, you know, hit them off the tee. But now we're going to come over here where we're going to be throwing the pitches and you got to work a little harder and now learn how to sell, learn how to work on your in-between, your cool stuff you did. You know what I mean? You got to test. You got just you, can, you have to learn how to do it all. You have to be able to do your cool shit. You have to be able to make it matter. You have to make other people's cool shit look good and you have to make that matter. You know, there's yeah. just it's just you know, there's so much to learn and do all across your job as an in-ring performer. And the thing is, wrestling, you know, it's so complicated. The fact that you're able to come up with an answer on the spot, because uh, we, I've sent you a bunch of questions. That wasn't one that I had on the list, so you just came up with that instantly. But it, what makes me think <laughs> is, like, the thing about wrestling is there's so much more that goes into it than just that, right? Like, we, you gave that example, but, you know, maybe that last guy, maybe people have high hopes. Maybe, like, for that person, they're like, okay, we want to test him and put him in the ring with these guys who are experienced and see how he does, too. So there's so many, like, the booking philosophy or everything. We dove a lot into the booking philosophy the last time we talked, and I thought it was very insightful. And uh, it's just there's so much that goes into why somebody's in the position they're in. And I, I just, I love picking your brain because you always give really good insight. So I appreciate that. Yeah. I mean, I've, you know, I've been very, you know, lucky to run 
festival shows, fair shows, regular independent shows, TV shows, you know, events that are incorporated with like a holiday, like that Walk of Fame show book. You know, it's just like I've done every kind of weird type of show you can do <laughs> food truck festival in the street. So, you know, and each one of those had a different need, you know, if it's the grand opening of a 7-Eleven, that doesn't need a story throughout the day. It just needs things that are eye catching. You know, if it's, you know, regular indie show with, you know, a month plus of hype and posters and matches that needs to tell a story, not only throughout the evening, but through each match as well. Absolutely. Uh, another fan question. I say a fan audience question. Uh, Jay Gass. I hope they're a fan. <laughs> uh, definitely of yours uh, do you believe that the world found out what socal already knows about jack cartwheel dude i tell you what i have seen jack cartwheel for quite a while pop up here and there in southern california um i met him i think in vegas right when things started opening up pandemic like i want to say 2021 at the jamie iovine uh Andy up show that we did where we worked second gear crew he was on that card or he was on the card later in the evening that was the first time i'd actually met him super nice super nice dude just you could tell he was just very happy to be a wrestler and, and be where he was you know a lot of people are grumpy at shows but you know this was a young guy that was still motivated and here i saw him at 75 even more motivated bigger smiles happier to be there that didn't that hasn't worn off you know the guy's been around the world he's done so much in such a short amount of time and sometimes that wears off or gives guys, you know, a bad attitude. He was the exact opposite. He was grateful to be there. He was ready to give it his best. Him and Colby absolutely tore it up, you know, and he's just a delight to have in a locker room too. So I think, yeah, I mean, he's he's shown people on a lot of different – in a lot of different places now from the independent level on the high independent level like GCW to Mexico where he shows out all the time and then now to a completely different audience with NWA who may not watch either of those. Now they're seeing him too. And in a lot of ways, to me, that's like kind of maybe the way people saw – you know, imagine guys that were WCW fans that followed TNA's early days and they saw AJ Styles. Yeah. You know, these are maybe big heavyweight NWA style, old school, you know, bigger guys like Trevor Murdoch style fans. And now all of a sudden they're seeing Jack Cartwheel, maybe. You know, it could be that same kind of impression where the sky's the limit for a guy like that. Like, you know, just because of his size and what he can do, like, that doesn't mean he can't reach these people in a way where he can go all the way to the top. He definitely feels a uh, fish out of water isn't necessarily the right phrase because that could have a negative inclination, but he's so different to the rest of the NWA right now. It kind of reminds me of uh, Matt Cross in the beginning of NWA when he was there briefly. He was like the only yeah, guy a- who was doing athletic stuff. And because of that, he stood out. You know what I mean? And when I say athletic stuff, I mean high flying Uber athletic stuff. Yeah. Obviously, everyone's yeah, I know an what athlete, you mean. <laughs> but- yeah, everyone's an athlete, but but you're right. That's more of that, you know, that that X division is probably the most simplified way to put it. Cruiser weight, junior heavyweight quote unquote flippy i mean he does flip like a yeah. maniac but that's that's a positive for him in my opinion you know nobody flips quite like him right now so uh now he's he's awesome you know a lot of people and what's even cooler about him is he has been making these strides as a wrestler while also playing college football and going to college oh wow in southern california he just finished so now he's all in on wrestling but a lot of people don't know that this guy was you know anytime he wasn't wrestling the only reason he wasn't is because he was playing college football wow so you know talk about a dedicated guy a loyal guy that completed all the years he'd committed to that football team despite starting to take off as, as a wrestler like i couldn't imagine being committed to something that i like finding something that i love i mean i don't know he might love football but clearly obviously wrestling is a path he's going with right now but like just imagine that two things you love and then like one of them you're really starting to get grounded but you're committed to the other for four years you know that that has to be a struggle but he still made it happen and then honestly it was you know if anything probably even more motivating for him to work harder you know achieve to to excel at two things at once that's pretty damn impressive yeah, it shows his character and like for promoters they probably look at that and they're like okay well we know this guy's committed we you know we know so that's awesome yeah yeah he's like this guy's in it he's loyal he's committed and he's here to work as hard as he can for as long as he's committed to that's that's crucial <laughs> yeah absolutely now the other the only other question i don't have a name for it i couldn't find it i was trying to look earlier they wanted to know about the rock nest monsters matches with uh, or specifically a match i don't know if you remember which one brian kendrick and paul london and if it stood out to you in any way yeah um you know it's weird like i i have no 
I have nothing but good things to say about Paul. I don't really know Brian. Uh, I've never really worked with him, but a lot of my friends have, you know, through WPW and other parts of Southern California. Um, but I was a huge, huge, huge Spanky and Paul, Paul London fan. Um, and then when I started going to UPW, you know, um, I would they were on like Velocity a lot. And then I started buying ROH stuff and finding their early matches against each other. I found like some Texas stuff of them. So like I just idolized these guys as junior heavyweights and, you know, dudes that were like in UPW and stuff like that was cool to me uh, that they came through there a little bit. Um, so, yeah, like it was like a dream match for me to wrestle them with with Kevin, my best friend, like absolute dream match. And it was just the shit. It just sucked. It was really? not good. Yeah, it was not good. I mean, and it's it wasn't good to me. Uh, the crowd was so it was weird. Like the Mach one crowd was an Orange County crowd, and this show was in San Diego, and it was still sold out, despite being an hour and a half away from our regular spot. It was around Comic Con weekend. The main event was Shel Shelton Benjamin versus Scorpio Sky. That was Shelton's first indie like ever. Oh wow! I remember his exact quote. He was standing outside, and he went, "Where are the guardrails?" <laughs> And all of us just started dying laughing because, you know, sometimes you forget not everybody was did independent shows. I mean, yeah. he went from being a collegiate standout right to OVW and then from OVW to TV, you know, like he never had to do this. He was, you know, he he just took a different path. So that was really funny to me. But, you know, so we wrestled on and Kendrick and, you know, it we had talked out a pretty exciting match one i was really excited about you know we kept a lot of stuff loose because we knew the crowd had been really hot already uh so we're like all right we'll, you know kind of just listen to the people see what happens and we get out there and like lennon and kendrick are over a shit and they come out as they should be mm -hmm. you know cruiserweight legends teaming awesome you know people were stoked and then we come out and we were the tag champs from awkward at the time and the place went nuts and that's not me you know kissing my own ass tooting my own horn we just were popular there at the time incredibly popular and they're behind us people are behind us they're chanting for us and I, I i turn around and all of a sudden i just get hit from behind and i was like oh what's going on here and paul just went ah we're going right to the heat you guys are way too over <laughs> and i was like oh like it, it just it broke my heart you know i wanted to do a bunch of bullshit yeah you know that's the easiest way to put it is me being a mark. I wanted to do a bunch of cool stuff with the wrestlers that I had idolized doing cool stuff. We had cool plans. I thought it was going to be exciting. I thought it was going to be a match I could send everywhere to get bookings. And it just wasn't that. It just turned uh -huh. into, you know, you know, just baby face fire from underneath for kind of what felt like forever. Only because I think I was let down in that moment. But, like, at no point did we lose the crowd. The crowd was into every bit of it. You know, I still made the hot tag to, you know, Kevin. He whooped them. Bop, bop, bop. We did some really cool stuff at the end. It's just, like, I selfishly was – I was – not only was I upset, I didn't get my chance – I didn't get my chance to shine and show that I could keep up with them. Everyone always knew Kevin was, you know – the better technical wrestler by far. That's just how our whole career has been. It doesn't hurt my feelings. It's just the facts. Kevin is amazing in the ring. He always has been. And, but this was my chance to show that, Hey, I can hang too. I'm not just the guy that gets beat up and tags out to the better wrestler. I can hang too. I can do cool stuff. And I'm going to show everyone that with two of the best damn wrestlers on the planet. And I, I didn't get to, and I was crushed. I was like super, I was only three years into the business. So that was really tough for me. To like, you know, meet my heroes and then feel like I did something to not deserve to get the most out of that. You know what I mean? And I took it personally for a long time, but like Paul has never been anything but good to me. Uh, he's always been so helpful. I love being on shows with him. He's super cool. He's cool to talk other stuff with, not just wrestling. It's just one of the, I mean, it was just one of those nights, the match. I'd hyped it up so big in my head. And it wasn't what I had already put in my head. And so it's as much on me as it is on that damn crowd for cheering for me so much. Definitely unfortunate, but I guess, you know, that's one of the things that you learn in wrestling. Sometimes things just don't go, you know, how you envision, even if maybe it would have been better if it was or, but then again, you said the crowd was so awkward. So who knows? Maybe it wouldn't have been, you know? Yeah. 
it was one of those things where, like, I mean, at the end of the night, the promoter was super happy. The fans were happy that we beat them in a pretty exciting fashion. You know, the end was still pretty hot. It was just, yeah, it was just one of those things where it just wasn't what I thought it would be. And I think had I maybe been a few more years in, it wouldn't have, I wouldn't have let it get to me so much. I would have just known, you know, to just take every match as an opportunity for something great to happen, but not create something great in my head before it even happens. You know, like just, it basically taught me not to count my chickens before they hatch with anybody and everybody, people I know, people I don't know, people I idolize, people I don't even like. You know, it just taught me just like, hey, just get in there and get through it. And then you'll then you'll know. <laughs> Great learning experience. And just as a plug for the channel, guys, if you're listening to this, we do have two full interviews up with Brian Kendrick on the channel already. A third one is in the works. I'm not sure when that'll be. So uh, but be sure to stay tuned for it. Check out the clips. Highly entertaining. Uh, the second one, especially, I really, really enjoyed. I enjoyed both of the second one I thought was even better. So check those out. Now. I didn't even know about this, but when you said, I, I, I got a few images from you that I needed for various uh, pictures, and there was a match that I just I had to talk about because I saw it. You and Gangrel, what happened there? What's the story there? I need to know all about it because he's been someone who's been brought up on the channel a lot. Like, we have Ruthie J, and she was trained by Gangrel, and yep. Sal told a great Gangrel story that'll be up either before or after this. So what what's the deal there? I'm curious. I mean, I, I want to start this off by saying that Gangrel is a saint. He is easily one of the best veteran wrestlers I have ever worked with in any capacity, whether sitting in the hotel lobby early before a shuttle, you know, sharing the ring, you know, just being on a show with him and him not knowing his opponent and me trying, you know, and asking, hey, what's this kid do? Stuff like that. Like it just, he's just the best in every way. He's a great teacher. You could see his school is always jam-packed with students. And from a fan standpoint, Gangrel has always been one of my favorites. Just to me that they're – I started – you know, Gangrel had always been around for two years when I started watching wrestling. Uh, he was always kind of on Sunday Night Heat, which was my shit. You know, I love Sunday Night Heat and Jack. And so I got to see him all the time, and I loved him. I thought he was so scary looking. And then watching more tapes back and stuff, I was like, oh, whoa, okay he was a vampire that showed up and Ed was supposed to be the vampire hunter. And then whatever got screwed up there, they put them together real quick and then added Christian and made something super cool. You know, they went, instead of being blade, they went from blade to lost boys. Kind of. Yeah. So, you know what I mean? Like, so it was it, whatever. It was still cool. I think it would have been cooler for him to have a foil that was exclusive to him. You know, Gangrel's in the World Wrestling Federation for whatever reason, and this outsider vampire hunter isn't trying to let him thrive or even survive. Like, I think that would have been cooler. They could have got to Lost Boys later, but either way, Brood was the sickest. Gangrel had the best music ever. Oh, yeah. Um, And so, you know, obviously, you love a wrestler growing up and all the way through his career. Speaking of that, he's a guy who's, like, never really taken a break. Yeah. You know, whether or not he's on TV, he is always wrestling. I first met him wrestling in Oregon. Um, and then, you know, he's, he's always, he's based out of Florida. So he's always wrestling around there. He's always on cool conventions where, with, you know, the wrestlers that look cool and still look cool and look like they, I mean, the guy looks exactly the same as he did, you know, 25 years ago. He hasn't aged a day. He's still big and jacked. He still hits that crazy, you know, wicked snap elbow. Uh, you know, it's basically like, here's a guy who's just still trucking and excellent at what he does and helpful to everybody at every level. You know, that's something you don't get from a lot of veteran wrestlers, uh, you know, despite how much you would want to, you know, from these guys that know so much and could pass on so much. Not too many do unless they can make money doing it. But here's a guy who does it just willingly all the time. If you're in the locker room with him, he will help you, you know, and I was so lucky. Me and Kevin, Kevin loves him too. Diehard gang growl fans, both of us. Uh, we got to wrestle him and this guy Jekyll's the Jester in Northern California. And I was bummed because there was two nights of these shows. It was called Wrestling for Charity. Night one, Rock Nest Monsters versus Gangrel and Jekylls. I was like, hell yeah. 13 people in the audience. I was bummed. But we tore it up anyways. There was, there was, I was like, I don't care. I don't know if I'm going to get to wrestle Gangrel again. I was like, we're going all out. And he was like, let's go. So we still had a really good match. You know, we were diving, taking, you know, I got to take so many of his cool moves. <laughs> Uh, you know, and it was just, it was just a pleasure, you know, to work with him and to have his respect after, you know, he, he shook our hand like, Hey, 
Because we, I mean, we gave it to him. We wrestled him the way we would wrestle anybody, hit him as hard as we would hit anybody. You know, we had to. He's a big, tough guy. We gave it to him. He gave it back. And at the end of it, it was just super cool to have gotten to share the ring with a guy like that and have such a positive experience and then have nothing but positive experience was with him after that everywhere I go, wherever I run into him. You know, it's just, it was just so cool. Um, I don't know. It's just one of those, you know, it's, it's another good example of, you know, never meet your heroes. No, 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 no. Meet them. Sometimes they're fucking awesome. Awesome. And every story I hear about them is good. Like uh, Sal was saying how he did a match with him, I think in October. And, you know, even though, <laughs> even though, you know, can grow, he's older and it was an indie show and he's like, no, clothesline me on the floor. And it's like, <laughs> he doesn't need to take a clothesline on the floor. He doesn't need to do that at this point, but he does just because he loves it and he wants to work hard. Yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. Like, he goes hard. He was just like, hey, like, blah, blah, blah. After that, you know, I'll, I'll powder to the floor. Uh, just hit hit a flip hit a flip off the apron on me, you know, into the chairs. And I was like, um, I mean, I mean, I guess nobody's sitting there. I guess we can. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I was like, all right, whatever you want, sir. Like, I'm happy to do it. You know, so I hit a shitty little tumbleweed on the basketball court floor. And But, yeah, no, he goes hard every time. And I've seen him wrestle really hurt, really hurt. Like, he showed up one time for a Jamie show and he had just happened to hurt his back the day before. And he still went out there and had a sick ass match. And like, he could barely stand up straight until the, you know, the music hit as soon as it hits, he turned it on, went out there, toughed it out, came back. and was like, Oh damn. <laughs> Very cool. Uh, let's see. The only other thing I wanted to touch on before we go back to the notes is uh, you teed this up a little bit last time, but we, we had to get out and you said it was a pretty long story, I believe. So now that we have time to get into it, there was a Kurt Angle One Direction story of some kind. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so um, I had wrestled for TNA. You know, I did the gut check, and then I did the uh, uh, impact, yeah. and then I did the uh, pay-per-view. And then, like, a year after that, or not not a whole year even, uh, Peter Avalon had started working there. And as I'm sure you all know from listening, he's one of my best friends. And... Um, one Direction was doing, they were doing something called 1D Day. It was an all day live stream on YouTube. This is 2013. So those live streams weren't, you know, a huge thing yet. They usually were like appointment based, not an everyday thing. So they set up this big thing. It was going to have big guests, Celine Dion, Simon Cowell, the Muppets were there, all this stuff. And then they had um, basically each, each dude in the band got something they really wanted to come and Liam Payne is a diehard wrestling fan. So they got in connection with impact and they were like, Hey, you know, we want him to wrestle. Can we, can we get him to wrestle? And they're like, yeah, we'll figure it out. We'll bring a ring. We'll set up a ring and we'll have him wrestle. And it was crazy. Cause there was a live audience there also like crazy little girl, one direction fans, like crazy, like tweens and teens. And it was like the craziest fans you can think of for any one thing. Uh, so they were there live and they're going like, oh yeah, he'll wrestle live. And they figured out whatever it ended up being, he's going to wrestle Kurt Angle. And I forget who was originally going to do it because they're like, well, Liam can't wrestle. So we'll do the old switcheroo. We need someone that's roughly boy band size. What do you know? Guess who doesn't really look like a wrestler? Me. So for once that came in handy for a nice payday and a really cool experience. Um, they were like, okay, well, we've used him before. Uh, Bob Ryder reached up. Peter Avalon recommended me. He was like, he was in the airport with Bob Ryder. You know, rest in peace. He was a great guy that helped me a lot. Um, Peter talked to Bob and was like, oh, well, you know, Yuma's in California where the YouTube place is. He's close. And, you know, he's definitely closer size than anybody out there. And he's worked for TNA before. Straight up, he just, boom, basically was like, give him the job. And so they, uh, they reached out and they got my measurements or whatever. And they, they had to make me a costume. And the bit was Kurt Angle would come out, talk his smack. Liam would come out through the people, whatever, in his costume without the mask on, talk to Kurt, blah, blah, blah. And then they would go to opposite corners and set up. Okay. And so while they went to opposite corners, they were going to cut the camera, both for the stream and to bring the attention of the live fans, like make them turn. Two other members of One Direction were in the parking lot. And they're like, all right, what do you think? How do you think Liam's going to do in the ring against an Olympic gold medalist? You know, that kind of little crap to kill some time. And so while they do that, I'm hiding under the ring. And he hops down like he's going to tie his shoe. And he goes under the ring and I pop up. 
we were not very similar in size. Not going to lie. He was quite a bit taller than me. I mean, much, I was just much stockier, uh, bigger butt. And literally, like, when I went from one of, like, I, 10 girls on this one corner of the ring had to have seen a switch. They had to. They had to. But they were so blinded by one direction that I don't think they realized what happened because they were just jaw just agape. I'm not even kidding when I say these girls look like zombies. <laughs> they were just like, just staring. And we switched right in front of them. I hop up in the ring, whatever. Now, originally, we were supposed to wrestle like a match, like a match match. Like I'm talking, I got in the ring with Kurt before. We worked together for like like an hour. It was a dream come true. He was so cool. Uh, you know, we practiced all these really cool high spots. Basically, I was going to get to run a bunch of old Ray Jr. Kurt Angle high spots. It was like literally – and it was to make Liam look good. The idea was to make Liam look like, oh, shit, like this guy's not just a fan. He's also a great wrestler. Holy cow, how how could it be? You know, that was the whole that was the whole goof that on this live thing, he would all of a sudden be this amazing wrestler because they didn't show him switch, you know. Everyone watching at home thinks it's Liam, you know, the old switcheroo, whatever. So we go over this match, we call this match, whatever, and I was winning, and it was just crazy. I couldn't believe it. I was like, wow, I'm going to do this match with Kurt Angle. I'm going to hit all these Ray Jr. high spots, like one of my heroes, and I get to go over. Yeah, it's not me, but it doesn't matter. I'm the one living this experience. This is going to be awesome. And then someone from One Direction comes up. This is earlier in the day. They're all inside with, like, the Muppets at this point or some shit. Um, and someone's like, wait, 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 I'm sorry. What was going to happen there? And it was the beginning. I was going to do a bunch of up and over, under, arm drag, this, that, blah, blah, blah. And then out of nowhere, he's going to clothesline me. That was like the stopping point. And then he would do some stretching, you know, some holes, just make, you know, basically work the crowd. And then we we're going to go to high, like, a bunch of exciting crap. And then I was going to beat him. Um, and they were like, oh, you can't hit Liam. And he's like, oh, well, I mean, it's not actually him. So it, it's fine. They're like, no, no, no. We don't want the girls to think he's getting hit. They'll be so upset. We'll break their hearts. They'll cry. Like, we're going to get complaints. Because the clothesline, you know, he was going to give me was going to be pretty nasty. He's like, you cannot hit him. You can't hit him in the throat. Like, they, were, their PR people were, like, freaking out. Like, you cannot hit Liam. Oh, my God. And they were like, what did you think? pro? And this is literally, like, you know, two hours before we go live. Oh, wow. This is happening. They were just, like, they just didn't know what pro wrestling was at all, apparently. No one told the legal team or whatever. So... We had to work around it to it being a bunch of haha, you know, chain wrestling, up and over, slide, crawl through the legs, a bunch of bullshit. And so it's kind of a bummer. But at the end of the day, he was like, hey, I don't care. We got to get something in, something good in. So we worked in a really cool high spot. And he was like, what's your finish? And I was like, oh, he's like, what do you want to hit on me? And I was like, holy shit. Like Kurt Angle just asked me what my finish is. Like, what a world. Um and I told him, I was like, well, it's a move that you've probably never seen before. I'm the only person that does it. I was like, it's like a, an X factor, but I jump and I wrap my shins around your neck and I trap your head. I was like, it's like a mini jumping pile driver. And he was like, that sounds badass. Let's do it. And I was like, oh, crap. So basically, I'm about to hit the sex factor on Kurt Angle. So we go out there, whatever. The girls definitely saw us switch. At least 10 of them did. And then we go out there and we do the thing. Awesome. It goes great. Uh, you know, Kurt Angle is literally a machine. I remember he whipped me to the corner and I thought I was going to just like fall face first through the post. Wow. Like just a regular Irish whip. This, this man threw me and like, he's working, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like he's not, he's, I'm, I needed to be at his level, not the other way around. He didn't give me some soft little baby, you know, fake lucha whip. He whipped me and I was like, good Lord. Like I, I almost botched right away, which would have obviously been, you know, typical Yuma, some kind of memorable mistake. Uh, but it went great. I hit the sex factor. He took it fucking perfectly. And he gave it like a family guy cell is what we call it, where you just lay dead with like an arm behind your back. And I roll him over and I pin him and I'm losing. I'm celebrating, you know, losing my mind. And one of the things I kept doing when I was supposed to be Liam was acting like a fan. We've all seen a celebrity get in the ring on Raw. We've all seen a fan hop in the ring. They always feel the edge of the mat. They hop a few times. They kind of, you know, lean on the ropes wrong. Like I kind of did all that stuff to make it seem like I didn't know what I was doing. And then when I won, I dropped to my knees like Kurt. So and I smart. was just, it, and it was awesome. It was so cool. We get to the back. The first thing he says to me was like, oh, man. He's like, you're great, dude. He's like, you're wow, that was awesome. He's like, I wish, I wish I understood your finisher better. He's like, I would have loved to spike on that. That would have looked great. And I was like, oh man, he wanted to, 
Mr. Broken Neck wanted to maybe break his neck for me. <laughs> what like, an it honor. just does so it was literally an honor. Like again, it's like a gang girl thing. You meet a hero, Kurt Angle's one of my all time favorites. To meet him, work with him, and it'd be just a day of like joy and learning. And and it was so cool because at the end, you know, we're getting changed. We just shared a green room, just me and him. All day, you know, we were eating fruit, drinking protein shakes, talking. Uh, we were both mad we didn't get to meet the Muppets. Um, you know, so it's just this great day. He was like, oh, what size are you? And he gave me tons of Kurt Angle shirts that he just had in his backpack. So random. Uh, I, remember I, I gave one to Peter because Kurt Angle is, is his probably all-time favorite as well. So I, I gave him, I definitely, because he got me the gig. I was like, well, I got to give him this shirt that's from Kurt. Like, he, I got to hook him up. Um, and then, you know, we're changing and he was just like, hey, man. You know, I just want to let you know that, you know, you must be you must be pretty damn good for them to put you with me. Like, or he said that before the match. I forgot to say it. he said that before the match, which made me nervous as hell. <laughs> yeah, no I totally pressure. I forgot that part. Yeah, he was just like, hey, you know, you know, you must be pretty somebody pretty special if they're gonna put you with me. I just want to let you know that. And I was like, oh great, I am not special, and now I'm nervous. And then of course he whipped me and I almost died, uh, but I made it to the ropes, <laughs> hit the up and over, hit that sweet arm drag, nice. A deep uh, kept control but yeah it was an amazing experience um i got to hang out with one direction for quite a bit earlier in between like little segments they had a breather and they all wanted to play in the ring and i was showing them how to do like nip ups and stuff um i don't know it was a crazy day it was an awesome payday and i got to hang out with a hero and have nothing but good things to say about it it was definitely one of the coolest things i've done in wrestling and I tried to keep the costume, but they ended up auctioning them off for charity. But I did get to keep my shoes, and they're some of the best wrestling shoes I've ever owned. However, they were a size too small, oh. an entire size, and I had to wear them for eight hours. Oh. My feet were purple. I literally had to drive home barefoot from L.A. It was like – I lived in San Diego still. Actually, I didn't even live in L.A. Pete just hooked me up anyways. I was like, yeah, I'll make it happen. I don't care. But, yeah, it was it was a crazy day. Sounds like an awesome experience, and it's pretty cool. You know, you look back, you had the uh, Bob Saget experience, you know, that we talked about the last time, then you had yeah. this. So it's pretty cool to see how, you know, and maybe it's because one of the benefits, you know, we talk about a lot of the drawbacks of, you know, some of the issues with Southern California and location and how it can be a struggle. But I think maybe that can be one of the positives, too, is because you're near L.A. and, you know, these big cities that at least that opens up some unique opportunities, if nothing else. Honestly, I, I will honestly say that is probably the one advantage to living in Southern California is that as a wrestler, you'll get unique experiences you may not get anywhere else. You know what I mean? Like the wrestlers have been on game shows, you know, they've been on drag race. We've been on reality shows. You know, I was on man versus food. Like it's just being in Southern California. They tape cool stuff here. And wrestlers are weird, and they always like weird stuff, you know. Like uh, I know Bad Dude Tito got to be on Wipeout, you know what I mean? Like it's just the out here that is that is the one plus I would say is you get to do cool stuff and meet like neat celebrities. That's that's pretty cool. I don't know if you get to do that working the mega indies in other parts of the country, but hey, at least we get to work with cool actors and hey the so, weather doesn't seem half bad either <laughs> you know what it's awful right now it is so hot but yeah it still beats probably everywhere else <laughs> that's great uh just real quickly to touch on the kurt angle thing as a aside you mentioned like you trained with him for like an hour before and can you talk about that like where was it when was it was it that day was it in like a different location what was training was, with him like it was all that day Oh, right. everything was that day. There was like five different st sound stages at the YouTube space or four, maybe we were in a green room between two of them. And then, and uh, they had finished one thing outside and cleared all that staging and then moved everybody inside. It was two sound stage bits in a row. Everything was about, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes. They were just hopping around from one bit to the next. It was like an eight hour thing. And then they're like, all right, you guys have, you know, about an hour outside where no fans will be out here. No girls will be out here. You guys will be okay to do whatever you need to do to prepare. So it was all that day. I met Kurt that day. I got my shoes that didn't fit that day. I got my costume that day. Like it was all boom, 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 all one day. And yeah, we just had about an hour. We just stretched together, rolled around. He was talking about, you know, his neck injuries and things he does to warm up. And I learned some good warm ups that I still do for my shoulders to this day um you know like it was just it was just cool man like it's just he's a regular guy who happens to be the ap one of the absolute best to ever do what i also do at a very different level <laughs> it's just it's just weird and weird and cool 
did you see what a full circle moment was at the time considering when you became a fan was when he was taking off like was that something that really clicked for you at the time or is it more like in retrospect you're like wow that's awesome i mean i think just my love of him as a performer in general stems from when i started for sure he was such a highlight of the first six months of WWF in 2000, you know, with his, he was still doing his three eyes, his abstinence, all his corny stuff. He started angle slamming old ladies. Like it was just, (laughs) he was just, he was just on that meteoric rise. And that was just kind of the very beginning of it where people were starting to buy into him a little more and a little more. And I got to be there for all of it until he won the King of the Ring. And then he was King Kurt, which was hilarious. Like what a, what a year for Kurt Angle. He won the title in Pittsburgh like it was just a perfect year for a wrestler and that happened to be my first year watching you know what I mean my first year watching was his perfect like run year uh that only led to more great years so it's just yeah like big affinity and attachment to him not only from when I started but I was just a big fan and then you know TNA made me an even bigger fan of him you know a lot of people will poo poo on TNA for whatever reasons they want but there are so many incredible moments that great wrestlers that people don't think of as TNA wrestlers had in their time there. And he's definitely an example of that. And I'm happy that him being with TNA somehow led to me getting to work with him. Now, awesome full circle moment. Now, before we get to the last question, because we do have to start wrapping up soon, as usual, you've been yeah, no a delight. You know, I always appreciate you being here. Hopefully we'll do a part four in the future so you can catch up we to will. Sal. Well, we will. I'm going to beat Sal. I'm going to whoop his ass. You... <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned the meteoric rise. And naturally... We have to bring up a current meteoric rise, someone that you worked with a ton, L.A. Knight, Eli yeah. Drake. Uh, he's had a couple other names. You know, we talked a little bit about you working with him and uh, Brian Cage in our last interview. I think at one point you were working with them. I think maybe actually it might have been related to the Bob Saget thing, maybe because you got hurt. You busted your face in the match with them. I could be yeah. conflating. No, no. Yeah, it was all. So I had hurt myself filming. I hurt myself the Friday afternoon filming for the Bob Saget show. And later that night, I worked uh, Brian and Rick, uh, Brian Cage and LA Knight, Sean Ricker. And um, the picture of me jumping with the bloody red hands from when my nose got broken a second time that day, uh, uh, Ricker's the one catching the crossbody. He, he, me and him came in on a hot tag and he didn't even know. He was like, what is going on? <laughs> I was just <laughs> like, I'm hurt. <laughs> Did you talk about the success he's had? Because right now he is, you know, the talk of the wrestling industry. And, you know, this will come out in a few weeks. I highly doubt that will change. Uh, is it one of those things where you saw his success coming because he looks like a million bucks and he's charismatic? Is it one of those things where you weren't sure because it took a while? And, like, are, what do you think of where's he, where he's at now? I mean, he's one of those guys where it was just like I, I've literally known him for 13 years i remember when he first showed up we started you know working with him at mach one and then from there to hollywood and in 2010 i was actually really really you know really close with ricker not only did we wrestle all the time um but i would crash at his place sometimes we would roll to hollywood tvs together i would go to the gym with him uh and the man is just so dedicated he's crazy like i was like yeah we'll go to the gym you know i thought we would drive and he's like no we're running And I was like, oh, shit. Like, okay, you look the way you do for a reason. We had to run super far (laughs) to the Hollywood 24-hour fitness. almost getting run over. This guy's a maniac, and he's fast, and he's strong, and I'm trying to keep up with him. Then we get to the gym, and I'm trying to keep up with him there. And then we have to go film TVs right after that. Well, guess what? We had to wrestle each other. So, you know, um, I was just, you know, he's one of those wrestlers like Brian Cage that I was just glued to for a long time, which is very funny. Because both Brian and Ricker, you know, dwarf me. They're huge guys. They're everything you think of when you think of a pro wrestler. And I'm the exact opposite. And I have wrestled them both a million times. Probably why they'll uh, fit so well, you know, the contrast. I mean, it tells it tells a good story, you know. We've, you know, Ricker can be as 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 like mean of a bully as, as it gets. And at my size, like, you know, he was managed by Percy Pringle. He and I had a singles feud in championship wrestling from Hollywood. Um you know, I, so I got to work with Percy, you know, on, you know, pro, with promos back and forth. And we had a little spot in the ring and going into a big match with Ricker. I think I beat him twice. Like, it was like, oh, how can this young kid keep beating this 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 big experienced guy? And then after that, he came out on top and then he moved into a feud with Brian that had a casket match. It was cool. And then from there, you know, he worked, he kept going up. Uh, he went to NXT after that. So it's like, 
he's he just kept I, I don't know how to explain it he's just one of those guys were like we're like okay well it has to happen it has to happen he did that reality show with the rock we're like okay like there's a reason he got picked for that that was on like cbs or whatever it has to happen for this guy it has to happen for this guy he'd been doing it for so long at such a solid level and then when he went to tna hey that's when really he started to kick his in-ring work up because we used to give him hell all the time we'd be like come on man let's do something cool and he'd be like no i saw big boss man do this in 1991 and i want to do that <laughs> and we would like every friday we would like legit like we would just argue me good time brian cage would be like ricker come on let's do this moonsault blah 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 and he'd be like no what if we do a, a superplex and that's the only bump of the whole match and we'd be like oh come on man like it's just it's funny because he thought one way for so 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 long and then perhaps tna where you know he started doing more like you know just a lot more higher pace different wrestling i think that got him out of his shell because the man's a freak athlete he can literally do anything we used to play basketball with him every single new year's you know the man up and down the court like nothing um and so it's crazy because like he could physically do all the things we always wanted him to do, but he liked a certain style and wanted to present a certain style. And then over the years, just not, you know, not even saying he was being stubborn. Maybe he was, we all are sometimes, but breaking out of that shell and being able to meld all that he loved about the bigness of the eighties wrestling with the excitement of a cool hop up to the top rope, belly to belly. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like he's, he he finally melded the things he likes with the things that were popular. And then, you know, all the while, always towing that line of the vibe of the Attitude Era. Yeah. And you could say that as a negative up and down all you want. There's tons of negatives to the Attitude Era. But his weird conf- – like his weird like over-the-top confidence uh, is something that was in the Attitude Era that I feel like doesn't exist anymore. And his feels authentic. It feels like it's from that time. LA Knight feels like, you know, like a fake person because it is so insanely over the top. You know what yeah. I mean? And he's someone I know, and he's just evolved into this larger than life thing. That's what you want to be in wrestling, larger than life. You are on a pedestal. These people look up to you. They view you. They pay to see you. And I believe that with him every bit of the way. I remember last time I think we hung out, we went to the beach like a couple years ago, right before he came back to WWE. And, you know, like, you know, we're all wrestlers. Everyone looks pretty good. But then there's freaking Ricker looking like damn Adonis on the beach, looking like God. Like, it just it's just crazy what he exudes and has always exuded. And, I mean, I used to stay with this guy in his apartment and all he would eat is bread and cheap Walmart protein powder. Like, that's it. Like, this guy has, you know, you know, he's had those low lows, you know. He started, you know, I think, what, HWA or Heartlands down there and then over the West coast and then signed and then released and back to the West coast and having to lose to me in the opening round of the Percy Pringle cup. You know what I mean? <laughs> like ups and downs, ups and downs, ups and downs. But you know, each time he just never gave up, certainly never slacked on his body, never slacked on getting work and staying busy. It's like with every time he crossed the coast, he got a little better each time and then just continue to show his value to undeniable. It's a corny thing to say. It's like a pro wrestling pay-per-view name, undeniable, but it is what it is. That is what he is. And the negative comparisons to the Attitude Era, I don't think they're just. I think I think they're fun. So many things that we love are influenced by things that came before them, and I think he's just another good example of that. You know, Everything is influenced by something. Being completely original is very tough, especially in pro wrestling, but to put your own spin on it, and to me, if you can get a whole arena saying, yeah, no, yeah. you've got it figured out. You like, I don't, I don't, it's, I, I'm, I hate when people argue with results. Yeah. That's Talk it. About you can't a, argue success. You can't, you can't argue with results, man. It, yeah. Like that's a word we all say a thousand times a day, a day. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, that man's got it on his butt. He's got it on <laughs> shirts. He's going to have it on shoes. He's got it on mountain dews. Like it, it, it's crazy. And, you know, I remember I made, I made him a pair of trunks. I used to make him, uh, him and Brian, I made them a pair of trunks. Uh, I made Sean a couple pairs where I took old pairs he had and put new stuff on them. And his old, before, yeah, you know, he used to go, huh? He had his huh thing. And so I made him a pair of trunks that said, huh, on it. And I always thought that was super funny. And I even wrote him a theme song called Gravy Train. And we just never got around to recording it. It was right after I did my song 
It's Johnny Yuma, which you can find on Spotify. They don't pay me for it, but it's there. Um, I'd written my own theme, and a lot of the boys at Hollywood really liked it. And so I'd been working on one for Brian, and I sang it for Brian once, and he loved it. Uh, and then I'd been working on a really good one for Sean. For whatever reason, Sean's just kept coming to me. And I wrote him a really cool theme song called Gravy Train. And then I just never got around to recording it for him. Uh, but, you know, Sean and I have been friends for a long time. Obviously, he's he's getting what he deserves as a talent and as a dude. And I'm happy to see it. It's pretty, pretty cool. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you for that. You know, we still have so much left to cover that we'll get to in the future. I really want to hear more about uh, Percy Pringle, Paul Bearer, because, you know, he's the fact that he had that, you know, SoCal run is really cool. And it's something that I feel like not enough people talk about these days. No, and it's really strange when you think about it. A guy from the territory he's from and from the peak of WWF that he's from to have a random little run in Southern California that really helped jumpstart a current star's career. It's pretty weird. Yeah, it, it's super weird, but super cool. We still have a lot more to talk about from your time in PWG, including the end. Uh, we have all of your time in championship wrestling uh, going on to booking and everything else. And Tons leaving there, there. <laughs> uh, joining the NWA, leaving the NWA. Uh, I think we even have something for Dragon Gate USA. I'm just going through some of the notes and there's just, you know, <laughs> the different era of the Rockness and the Vermin and CZW. And, you know, we, <laughs> there's a lot. There's a lot. So I, I appreciate your time. The last question I always like to wrap things up with, because like I said, I think it can change every time. What does the future look like for Captain Johnny Yuma? Um, the future looks really good. As a performer, this is my 16th year coming up here in November uh, of in-ring. I started training in 2006, debuted in 2007. I've been doing this a long time, but no real stop. Certainly nothing behind, no stopping behind the scenes. So with injuries or whatever, I've still always been producing or writing or booking or getting paid to do something not in the ring. Um, and through all that after 16 years with what I saw coming out of NWA 75 and, you know, just, just the new strides we took at TV. I just think the future looks bright for me um, behind the scenes. Uh, you know, obviously I still got to quote the great Mark Henry in one of my favorite moments in all of pro wrestling. I still got a lot left in the tank. I know big hunky Kev, Kevin Martinson, Johnny Goodtime, whatever you want to call him. He's got an endless fuel tank. So the Rodney's monsters are ready to go. You know, we're always ready for bookings, internationally ready, passport. We got visas for different countries. We're ready to go at all times. Listen I'm up, promoters. Ready to wrestle. I am always ready to wrestle. I'm probably in the best shape I've been in in years, and I feel like it's a bit going to waste, but that's okay because my mind isn't. I'm still helping a lot of young talents and guiding a show that I now really, you know, that I really believe in, uh, you know, getting to be a part of that moving forward and getting better all the time. That feels good. So it feels good, and the future looks bright. One more time, where can people check you out? Check me out on Instagram and Twitter all the time, posting stuff all day long, at Yuma Booma, Y-U-M-A-B-O-O-M-A. And then, of course, check out NWA Power on YouTube on the NWA's official channel. Check out my old matches and my favorite thing, toys, on YouTube.com slash Johnny Yuma Rocks. And check them out on the NWA, guys. And don't forget to check us out on Twitter at Armbar Sidebar, on Instagram at Armbars and Sidebars, and on Threads, even though we don't use it at Armbars and Sidebars. Say, I don't use it either. <laughs> <laughs> and don't forget to subscribe to us on YouTube. We're making slow and steady progress, and I appreciate the support. Make sure to leave a comment, leave a like on all the videos. Uh, we try to respond to every comment as long as it's not hateful. You know, we don't support that, but everything else, go for it. Good, bad, and different don't care about that at it love to hear it. love the conversation uh thank you for supporting the channel thank you for supporting johnny yuma and thank you sir for being here it was another delightful episode thank you for having me man i can't wait to be back until next time guys later <laughs>